Well, who could have predicted this to turn into a punishment of my own design? But now as we wrap up this month, it means we are finally, mercifully, at the conclusion of Hulkamania. Now last week here on the channel, we took a broader look at Hulk Hogan's time in TNA. And this week here on the Classic Review, we take a micro look at a show that would give us Hogan's last pay-per-view match of his career. I'm talking about TNA Bound for Glory 2011 from October 16th at the Leah Kouris Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hulk Hogan has been running wild on impact as not only the biggest heel of the company for the last year, but also as the man in charge in kayfabe. Meanwhile, new champion Kurt Angle is pitting the Brothers of Fortune against against each other as Bobby Roode has aspirations to climb to the top of the mountain. Those are the two biggest storylines happening right now in TNA, as is reflected in the opening hype package for this show. The first two shots you see are of Hulk putting on the tights, Sting wearing the classic makeup. Yeah, you're not getting those here tonight. Whoa, crazy crane cam here to open up the show in Philly. Nearly 3,600 folks in the venue, between 20 to 25,000 pay-per-view buys makes it one of the better selling shows they had all year. Mike Tanay and Taz are on commentary, and we open up with a match for the X Division Championship as Austin Aries defense against the Wizard of Odd, Brian Kendrick. Kendrick is a former X Division champion, recently came back to Impact, won a multi-man ladder match to earn a shot against Aries and his championship. And according to Taz, he's got his juju beads around his neck as he makes his way to the ring. Aries with a huge reception in Philadelphia. You're going to see that a few times in this show, where somebody who is definitely being booked as the heel on TV gets a hero's welcome and is received very well in the Philadelphia crowd. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that those guys are like Ring of Honor originals and Philly was the birthplace of that. The match begins with the feeling out process, moves and counter moves. Kendrick hits a few consecutive monkey flips, but A double blocks one and begins to slow things down as he takes over. Aries teases the pendulum elbow to a ridiculous degree and Kendrick has time to recover. Aries cuts him off though, then gets the elbow off. Aries hucks himself into Kendrick on the outside and they crash into the barricade. Brian comes back, the sliced bread is blocked, they fight up top and Brian hits the super sliced bread, only a two count, goes for it again on the apron but Austin blocks it, Brian takes a big tumble to the outside, brain buster by Aries for the win and the champion retains. Three and a half stars out of five for me on this one. I will always enjoy a good old fashioned, you know, cruiserweight or X Division style match, high flying, high impact kind of match to open things up uh, for a pay per view like this. I think that Kendrick and Aries have two very different styles here. They're both very unique in their own way, but they got to shine through in this one. I think that their styles meshed well together, and this is a very solid opening match. Backstage, the Jarrett kids hanging out with Tracy Brooks, who's Karen Jarrett's assistant. Then afterward, Karen telling Tracy she doesn't want to see her near the kids, especially with her top cut so low. Karen pulls out a special referee outfit for the knockouts title match, which Tracy disapproves of, but Karen insists she's the most qualified referee for this matchup and tells Tracy not to come to the ring tonight unless Karen is in the line of danger. Foreshadowing! Up next, it's full metal mayhem as Rob Van Dam takes on Jerry Lynn, the classic ECW rivalry revisited here. In fact, this is the match we were supposed to get last year at Hardcore Justice, but didn't happen because Lynn had an injury, so Sabu was a last minute replacement. Jerry is back at Impact and has now turned heel. Lynn is damn sick and tired, damn damn sick and tired, tired of being in RVD's shadow. And what an appropriate match for these two to have, what an appropriate location. The fans do a disjoint an EC dub chant to start things off. <laughs> Nice throw back to begin the match. The two have a sequence with a lot of quick back and forth. Lynn goes to cross body Van Dam out of the ring, but they just crash into the ropes and take a rough landing. They move to the outside. Rob goes to moonsault off the barricade, but JL moves and brings a ladder into the ring. Jerry drop kicks the ladder into RVD's face as he's holding a chair on the outside, but we don't get a really good shot of it. RVD with a running drop kick into the corner with the chair follows up with the rolling thunder onto the ladder sandwich. Van Dam with his very unnecessary backflip to the chair, which allows Jerry to fire back. He goes for a dive on Van Dam on the ladder, but Rob moves. Van Dam with a beautiful acai moonsault onto his opponent with the ladder assist. Lynn brings out another ladder, leans it up against the barricade. Van Dam goes to the suplex off the apron. Lynn counters into a sunset flip powerbomb that could have gone very badly for Lynn's leg. Jerry grabs the chair and swings to the fences, but much like how you don't try to powerbomb Kidman, you don't try to hit RVD with a chair. Rob with the Van Daminator follows up with the Van Terminator 
Eric covers the ladder in between them. Rob Van Dam wins. I'm going to give it four stars out of five. This is my pick for match of the night. And I tell you what, these guys may not be in their physical prime like they were, you know, 10 years earlier in ECW days, but this is still a kick-ass match. These guys really have a magic that cannot be duplicated. Yeah, they showed it. They still got it here. Triple threat match up next as Samoa Joe battles the blueprint Matt Morgan and the undefeated rookie in Crimson. Crimson was at the top of the Bound for Glory series over the summer until Samoa Joe took him out with a leg injury. Crimson comes back a few weeks before this show. We'd see he and Morgan help each other out from beatings by Samoa Joe. So Joe wants to fight both of them in a triple threat. Kill two birds with one stone, I always say. It's very interesting to see Crimson and Morgan look somewhat matching going into this thing. We get what looks like accidental contact by Crimson early on, but the two bigger guys work together to beat up Joe to booze. Joe is able to take down both men by himself, though, and like I mentioned earlier, he is very well received. Crimson and Matt are arguing, which allows Joe to stay alive, follows up with a big diving forearm. Not to be outdone, though, Morgan diving off the top and onto the floor onto Crimson. Only Joe had the nope ability on that one. In the middle of this match, though, you hear the fans chanting, you screwed Brett toward Earl Hebner, who's the referee here, but like, he didn't do anything in this matchup. Like, really? Now? Okay. Joe seems to spike himself on his own suplex. Either that or he's just really good at selling. Morgan and Crimson finally have it out and trade blows. Morgan wins the exchange, but Joe back in the mix. Sets up the muscle buster, but it's broken up. Joe takes a knee, walks into a spear by Crimson, and the undefeated rookie stays that way. I give it three stars out of five. Joe looked amazing in this matchup, which is all the more sad when you see he's the one who takes the fall in this thing. Clearly carrying more than his own weight in this matchup. Not saying that Morgan and Crimson are bad in this match, because they're not, but it's very clear in this one who the ring general is. But I gotta give, you know, Crimson props for looking uh, pretty darn good for someone who has, as, you know, untested, who's is young in the business as he is at this point. And Morgan also took some risks in this match, which I do appreciate. JB backstage doing his stand-up when in comes Bully Ray sporting a Yankees cap here in Philadelphia. He admits he's been exploiting Philadelphia for the last 15 years, abusing and taking advantage of the city, raping the fans in his own words. He says he has seven cars and five houses, all thanks to the white trash in Philly. That's heat. On we go now to a false count anywhere match as Bully takes on Mr. Anderson. Now, earlier in the year, Mr. Anderson was given an ultimatum to join Immortal. He did accept it. He joined the group, and soon after, he beat Sting to win the TNA World Championship. But not too long after that, fellow stablemate Bully Ray was being a thorn in his side. Anderson was kicked out of the group after Hardcore Justice now wants more revenge against Bully, challenging him to this matchup. Anderson just runs down to the ring. The match begins in earnest. Bully rips Ken's shirt off his body, hitting some scintillating chops. It sounds awful. Well Anderson goes outside grabbing a fan's sign, but surprise, it's a street sign in disguise. On the outside, a bunch of fans get sprayed with beer. They fight their way up to the stage. Bully lays out Anderson, then summons Anderson's own microphone. Bully begins to introduce himself, but Anderson cuts him off and says, Welcome to Philly, bitch. Fighting continues backstage. Bully with a pile driver on the concrete, but somehow Ken kicks out. The fight eventually heads back to the ringside area. Anderson brings in a whole section of guardrail, hits a back body drop on Bully, who lands on it. Mr. goes for a dive, but he misses. Bully with a bubba bomb through a table. Bully goes for a dive, and he also misses. Mike check on the guardrail. There's a kick out. Anderson getting a trash can from under the ring. Bully gingerly placing himself onto a table on the outside. Mr. with a big swanton off the top, but the table does not break. They cover it with a mic check to break the table. Anderson pins to win. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This was a very physical matchup. It was a war. I think these guys really brought a match befitting the stipulation and the heat that these two had and it ended up with an outcome that people really liked to see and they covered for that botch the table not breaking fairly well I would say. Uh, you know, this feud would continue on to the next month at Turning Point and Ken would be done with the whole immortal stuff but oh the feud between Mr. Anderson and Bully Ray would only continue on with Aces and Eights coming around the corner. Backstage some sneaky footage of Eric Bischoff talking to referee Jackson James. He makes it clear that Hogan's got to win and Sting needs to be taken out. Jackson says He's got Eric's back. Eric calls him son. Taz and Tanay are in shock at this revelation. And honestly, so am I. Because me having not watched TNA during this time, I had no idea this was how the reveal happened that Jackson James was actually Garrett Bischoff. Up next, the Knockouts Championship match as Winter defends against Velvet Sky, Mickey James, and Madison Rain with special guest referee, the Vice President of the Knockouts Division, Karen Jarrett. Winter won the Knockouts title back at No Surrender the previous month. 
month, and in the weeks afterward, there were a series of qualifying matches on TV to see who would challenge the champion at the pay-per-view. By the way, I love Karen Jarrett's theme at this point in the company because it's just Jeff Jarrett's theme with a little beat thrown in. And our guest was the match begins with Mickey and Winter squaring off. Karen clearly biased against Mickey and Velvet Sky in this one, at one point literally directing traffic and telling Winter and Madison to tag the other two in so they can fight each other, but Karen's not counting for either of them. The match gets a boring chant for a second, but the ladies do try to pick it up. Eventually, all four women are in the ring for a bit. We see Mickey and Winter again. Angelina loves slipping something to her, Master Winter. Karen gets in Mickey's face about the punches. Winter spraying the blood but misses her target and gets Karen instead. Mickey's got the match won, but the referee is blinded. Tracy Brooks emerges and takes over as referee. Velvet plants Madison Rain, then Tracy counts the three, and we get a new champion. I give it one star out of five, and it's a big win for Velvet Sky here, but this match is very boring, and it goes very long. It's just kind of a rough match at times. Uh, Karen, as the referee, is the story in this match, and while it does add some intrigue to the build, it also takes away from the rest of what's happening in there, and I think that it was just to the detriment of the match overall, I would say. Backstage, JB with Kazarian asking for his thoughts on the upcoming I Quit match between his two very good friends, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels. He says he's very torn about who to root for in this thing, but just hopes that everyone is okay in the end. On we go now to that I Quit match as Styles takes on Christopher Daniels, or as he was once known, Daniels. Former best friends and fellow members of Fortune are now torn asunder. These guys have had a friendly rivalry, but the last time they wrestled, Daniels won, couldn't shut up about it, leading to the two having a falling out. Daniels turns heel, and that's how we get this match. The bell rings and Christopher tells AJ to quit like 10 seconds in. Can you imagine? AJ works over Daniels in the early going, a big plunge out of the outside by Styles, but Daniels grabbing the toolbox from under the ring and fights back. Chris almost stabs AJ in the eye with a screwdriver. We also get a big stab attempt where the screwdriver is embedded in the turnbuckle. Nasty spill for both guys on the apron. Daniels keeps asking. AJ keeps saying no. BME on the back. Daniels chokes AJ out with the chair and talks trash as he does it. He wants AJ to take his last breaths. More villain monologuing. Tells AJ he'll tell his wife his last words were, I love you. He looks to the camera and tells Wendy to take the kids away because he's going to straight up murder his ass. AJ fires up and comes back in a big way, hits the acai moonsault into the reverse DDT. Die AJ from my clothesline. AJ hits the Styles Clash, grabs the screwdriver and threatens Daniels with it and Chris just up and says he quits and flees the scene. So AJ wins. Styles celebrates on the stage but then Chris jumps him, hits the angel's wings on the stage. He shouts that AJ never beat him even though he technically did but this feud is far from over. I give it two and a half stars out of five, and I'm kind of being generous with that one, because, you know, you're never going to hear me say that AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels are not amazing wrestlers. You'll never hear me utter one contrarian thought to that idea, but this was not a match befitting their styles, no pun intended. You know, these guys are fast-moving, they're high-flying, they're cruiserweights, they're X-Division wrestlers. So to put them in this matchup here, where there's all this, like, personal animosity with, like, the stabbing with a screwdriver and threatening to kill people, it's like, it's not befitting of what fans want to see. It doesn't befit these two guys. Like the heat's there, but I think Daniel's heel turn is so recent here for him to like threaten murder, which by the I've said before on this channel, threatening wrestlers with murder is so stupid because it's kind of hard to follow up on. But for them to do that, I just thought it was, it was not, it, you know, it was a fine match. It just didn't fit the mold of what these guys had. And I don't want to say keep guys boxed into a certain type of match, but sometimes some styles of match work for wrestlers and some of them don't. Well, earlier in the year, Victory Road happened, and many of us remember what happened on that fateful night. Jeff Hardy showing up in the main event majorly messed up. He embarrassed himself and the company. He goes to rehab. He recently returned to TV doing a redemption angle. Wouldn't be the last time. And of course, there are going to be heels who are going to go on camera and tell Jeff how much of a screw up he's been. Guys, like Eric Bischoff and Jeff Jarrett, who makes his way to the ring in an unscheduled segment. Last week on Impact, he warned Jeff Hardy not to show up at Bound for Glory.
glory. So then Jeff was like, I better get a ticket to Philadelphia. He tells Hardy that no one in this company wants anything to do with him, not even the merch people. The fans don't want him either, which the live fans seem to disagree with. He calls Nero out and says he brought him into TNA. He'll take him out. Jeff makes his way to the ring and Mike Tanay says, Jeff Hardy's response since returning, mixed. Jeff gets on the mic and says, I just want to say one thing to you. Boom, the fight's on. It turns into a big pull-apart brawl with security guys, referees getting involved. Even D'Lo and Al Snow and Simon Diamond get involved. Massive D'Lo chant, by the way. Then a head chant as Jarrett shouts, nobody wants you here to Hardy. This feud would continue for a while, and the big high point came at the next pay-per-view where Hardy beat Jarrett three times in a row in a single night. In your semi-main event for Control of Impact Wrestling, Hulk Hogan takes on Sting. Last year at Bound for Glory 2010, Hulk Hogan turned heel. He formed Immortal with Eric Bischoff, Abyss, Jeff Hardy, etc. And has really been the big bad for the last year in this company as he and Bischoff stole ownership of Impact from right under Dixie Carter's nose with some deft legal maneuvering. Sting never trusted Hogan since he arrived in TNA, and as the months go on, Sting has challenged Hogan to a match fighting to regain control of the company on behalf of Dixie. Hogan is costing the TNA title, cost him matches for the title, but Hogan has still refused to wrestle Sting. Finally in October, Hogan decides it's time to finally retire. He does the big speech, he's saying goodbye to the fans. Sting comes out and reveals that secret security footage showing Hulk and Bischoff lying about the retirement. Yes, the coincidental nature of this storyline device being used and how Hogan has been affected by something similar IRL is not lost on me. So Hogan gets mad and makes the fight for he and Sting at Bound for Glory, offers up control of the company if he loses. The one, well, one of the big problems I had with this whole part of the storyline is Hogan's fake retirement. To what end? If Sting did not show up to reveal that Hogan and Bischoff were lying about the retirement and Hogan got to finish his speech and was assumedly retired, like then what would happen to him? Because if he was really walking away from wrestling, wouldn't he also be willingly giving up control of the company to someone, presumably? I mean, you could say he was going to do the retirement thing because he didn't want to fight Sting and this was his way out of it at first. But even if he's going through with all that, you know, it's like, what's going to happen? Like, in that whole storyline, if that if that timeline occurs and Hogan re retires unabated, then, like, what is Hogan getting out of this aside from not fighting Sting? As the legends make their way to the ring, we see Dixie Carter in the crowd. She gets bonked in the face by a sign. Come on, she says. Sting comes out wearing Hogan's shirt for mind games. Hogan beckons to the stage and Ric Flair shows up. The fellow immortal mate sits ringside for the Hulkster. It's insane to think how often these guys crossed paths and clashed and worked together and apart in WCW over the years. And they're still going to that well 10 years after the company folded. We get a headlock to start things off. Hogan flexes and crotch chops. Here's a familiar sight. Hogan works over Sting forever. Flair gets involved on the outside, and the crooked ref Jackson James keeps himself looking away from all of it. Hogan with a low blow right in front of Dixie Carter at ringside. Hogan is passed a spike by Flair. He hits Sting with it. Sting is bleeding now. He fires up with some punches to Hogan. He uses the spike on his own. Hogan takes a bump, blatantly gigs himself. No effort made to cut away from it. Now Hulkster is bleeding profusely. Flair's chased away. We get a couple of stinger splashes, the scorpion deathlock kinda, Hogan taps, and Bischoff's son has no choice but to end the match. Ric Flair jumps Sting after the bell, then the rest of Immortals show up. Everyone beating up Sting with chairs, Abyss looks on from the shadows. Finally, Jackson James takes the chair from his own father, Eric, who then clatters his own son in the back with it. What a quick turnaround of events! This referee's his son! Now he's getting hit by his own father! Sting begging Hogan for help as the beating continues. Hogan rips the shirt and hymns up to a massive reaction from the fans. He lays into his immortal mates. He and Sting work together to fight off the baddies. Bischoff's left scared in the corner. Hogan bops him with a punch. We get the showing of respect by Hogan and Sting. So I guess 15 years of bad blood could all be washed away by a simple hug and a handshake. Two and a half stars out of five for me. This match, I don't think, is a very attractive one. Uh, Hogan definitely showing his limitations physically, but Sting is able to carry him to still a good match with like a decent story, good pacing. Hey, the build for this match was really good. I think the execution was pulled off pretty well, too, all told. And uh, I will lump in this post-Bell incident with Immortal and Hogan's face turn as part of it, too, because that was the big payoff, was Hogan finally turning face and Sting getting control of the company. They had their cake and they ate it, too. 
Hogan gets to get the crowd cheering at the end and Sting gets to win for Dixie Carter and everything. On the impact after this show, Dixie declared Sting the new GM of the company, which will play a role to something I'll talk about after the main event. And here it is now for the TNA World Championship as Kurt Angle defends against Bobby Roo. Bobby recently won the Bound for Glory series, making him the new number one contender for the championship and all this momentum and all this build is behind him now. They're showing all the hype packages of him working out and wrestling and being with his family and talking about how important it is to be the champion. They're showing the fans chanting next world champ every time he shows up and wrestles. Kurt Angle, meanwhile, is the current world champion, recently joined Immortal and his buddy buddy with Hogan and Bischoff, so he gets to have some booking power. He has put the members of Fortune against each other here. He wants Bobby Roode to fight all three of his brothers in Fortune. If any of them beat Bobby, they get the next shot at the title should Roode win at Bound for Glory, but Roode is able to beat all of them on television. And once again, the whole story here is, can Roode do it? The pressure is all on Bobby now, not on Kurt. And it's almost a foregone conclusion the way they're building this thing, and also with the real-life revelation that Angle is working hurt at this point, that, oh, it's clearly Bobby's time. And speaking of which, you know what it's time for Kurt Angle to do? Take a break. It is so hard to jump into TNA during this time and witness, like, Perk Angle in all its glory. When Kurt looks so skinny and he's just hurt all the time, his voice sounds different, he's got those dead eyes, his teeth have somehow outgrown his mouth. I don't understand how that works out, but yeah, it's, a, it's really hard to watch Kurt Angle at this point, knowing that he can still go and perform, which is insane to think about, but also was what his body is going through at this point. It's it's very sad to see. And thank God, though, things turned out okay. And we can look at now in 2023 and say, hey, Kurt turned out all right. Early on, the match spills to the outside. They go back in, and Kurt kicks the rope, which hits Rude and the little bobbies. Angle hitting those Germans and applying the pressure onto Rude. Goes up top, but Rude suplexes him off, and Kurt backflips onto the mat. Hits a blockbuster from the second rope for good measure. Angle puts a stop to him with a big DDT and a big suplex off the top. Rude gets his cross face applied in the middle of the ring, but Kurt somehow counters into an ankle lock, then back to the cross face. Keeps it on, but Kurt slips out and hits the angle slam. Rude continues to show the heart. More close calls as we get dueling chance for champion and challenger here. Kurt using the referee as a human shield, which allows him to take Rude to dick kick city. Angle slam and a kick out. Germans countered into another cross face and a rope break. Kurt goes for a flying nothing, walks into the submission again. Attempts are traded. Kurt hits the angle slam. We get the cover. Rude's arm is very much under the rope. Kurt definitely using the rope for leverage. The referee misses all of this. Stalls as he counts the three. Whoops! Kurt retains. I give it three stars out of five. This match was okay uh, for the most part until the end. I think it got a bit repetitive by the end when it's just like fighting for submission after submission. At that point, I think it just kind of gets uh, stale to me and so I wasn't really feeling it by that point. And then they fucked up the finish. And even if it had gone smoothly and the referee actually had like the proper rhythm to finish the three count and didn't look like he was pulling his three uh, before it happened, turns out it's a very similar finish to something that happened at SummerSlam that same year. So it's not even a very original ending. But yeah, it was very frustrating to watch this and see how much they built for this is Bobby's moment. This is going to be Bobby's moment. It's his time to become champion. He is the future. He is the star. And then he loses. And everyone, uh, and also the knowledge that Kurt is working hurt seems like a reasonable thing for him to drop the belt to Bobby because it's his time. Let's strap the rocket to him. And we don't get that. Not here anyway. It's very confusing because the very next impact after this show, we get this moment here where Sting makes a match between Kurt and James. James Storm for the championship, which Storm wins, and then he loses the belt to Bobby Roode like two weeks later. According to the newsletters at the time, allegedly, and I want to emphasize, allegedly, this was Hulk Hogan's call. He apparently came up uh, the last minute and said that Bobby Roode shouldn't win at the pay-per-view because it wasn't his time or he wasn't ready, what have you. And again, it's alleged, never been confirmed. If you listen to Eric Bischoff's podcast, he will tell you in very colorful language why the dirt sheets and the newsletters were wrong about that assessment. But uh, even if it wasn't Hogan's call, it still seems like a very dumb, short-sighted thing. Because, like, you give Bobby Roode that moment, like, a few weeks after this, but it's like, you had the moment right there at this pay-per-view. It seemed like an easy slam dunk of a choice, a natural outcome of Roode winning the belt, and then feuding with Storm after that. But they totally muck up the order, and hey, that whole vibe of, like, easy slam dunk on a big show, totally missed. I felt like we just felt that and saw that happen earlier this year in our own timeline. 
My grade for TNA Bound for Glory 2011 is a C plus. Uh, this show starts off really strong, I gotta say, with one, a hot crowd in Philadelphia, and then you've got the X Division title match I liked a lot, uh, Full Metal Mayhem, the Anderson Bully, uh, Falls Count Anywhere matchup was really strong. And I will, I will say, Hulk and Sting defied my expectations. Like, you know, for Hulk being as old broken down as he was, they managed to turn out a pretty decent match all told. But you know, there's some other things in that second half of the show that do kind of falter. Like Styles and Daniels, it, the I Quit match did not fit their whole vibe. Uh, the Knockouts title match was what it was. And then yeah, the finish for the main event kind of really, really soured me on that whole match, I would say. Like it was still, I still gave it like a decent grade, but it would have been a higher grade had like, even if Angle won and if it was done more cleanly, I would have appreciated that more than how that particular finish went down. So, you know, Hogan and Sting ending the way it did, at least Hulkamania ends on a surprisingly upward note. Well, Hulkamania is officially in the past right now. June is going to be anniversary month, celebrating 10 years of regret right here on this channel. And so to celebrate, the month is going to be full of programming very near and dear to my heart. We're going back next week with another classic pay-per-view review, and we're going to cover one of the earliest shows of my fandom, fully loaded 1998. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.